Big Questions with the Dead Milkman. Welcome to Big Questions with the Dead Milkman. This week, we are going to go down memory lane again by popular demand and talk about our second album, Eat Your Paisley. And the question is, what are your memories, good or bad, of making the Eat Your Paisley album? Except for Dan, the question is, what are your memories, if you have any, of first hearing the album? And I'd like to do it a little differently this time, if Dan gives me permission, <laughs> to hear his memories first. And then we'll talk about what we have, our memories of making it, his memories of hearing it. And if he has any questions <laughs> <laughs> that we might not be able to answer. answer. So tell the truth. <laughs> well, I will I will hold off my questions until you guys have all spoken, maybe. Okay, you can. You can answer one of them. Um well, I I remember hearing this album very well. Um my cousin Woods uh had it on C D and one summer we were up at our our summer place and we listened to it a lot um <clears throat> i remember we would play it before we went to bed and just like have it play on um shuffle and stuff and i remember in the morning we both had the same experience where we had woken up in the middle of the night and the song earwig played like three or four times in a row and i remember because both of us were still you know we thought the other was asleep but we in the morning i was like you know that one song played over and over again he's like i heard that too um well actually dan it is on the album four times in a row so it wasn't a mistake <laughs> we, we had a, we, we needed to do a lot of filler there i'll, I'll explain there the cd version it's, yeah, an CD yeah. it's an appropriate song to do that because it, it is yeah, an yeah. um which incidentally is disgusting and i feel like there was another level that you guys added to to this album like the air crash museum like talking about all the people who had died in airplane crashes um the the fez is just plain weird um and i don't know i just thought i thought that this album it has like a it almost sounds like a cleaner sound than big lizard um but it's got some great songs and uh it has i hear your name which stands out to me, it always did. Because, um, you know, when I was a, a young teen listening, I, there was a lot of funny songs, and that one kind of was a little more, like, heartfelt about the loss of uh, a friend, I guess. Um, but I actually happened to have the tape here that I made from Woods' CD. Um, it has Eat Your Paisley and Beelzebub is on the other side. Don't and you understand that taping music is killing the music industry? <laughs> That's why you guys broke up. That's why we're, why we're broke. Not why we broke up, why we're broke. Well, you guys get more royalties than I do. <laughs> um, well, because you have more songs that I wasn't on. Um, but what's funny is I, I can't play this at the moment, but I remember at the end of the first side, which is Eat Your Paisley, you hear Woods' prepubescent voice say, that was Eat Your Paisley and Beelzebub was up next, both by Dead Milkman. So if I can get a tape deck, I'm going to... Oh, yeah, I, we'll sample that. We'll sample that and put it on something. I, I swear, it's, it's where his voice cracks in it, too, which is perfect. Like the guy who was uh, now doing the presidential announcement, the governor of South Carolina or whatever, he did a Peter Brady the other day. <laughs> it's called uh, Peter Brady, folks. Yeah, when your voice cracks. Yeah, when it's time to change. <laughs> um. So, yeah, I, other than that, um, I I don't know. I love that album. I, that's another one that has a, a song that wasn't on the the, uh, the the vinyl, the Vince Lombardi Service Center, which is crazy because that's, that's on this tape because it was on the CD. So I know that song is part of the album, and it's such a good song, and it's funny to think that it was just kind of like a – well, you guys will – hopefully you'll talk about it. It's not on the album. Right. Okay. No, he's saying it's not on the album. He says it's not on the album. No, it's not on the album. But it is on the it's on the 
CD. This isn't Metallica. CD. You can't be a dick to the new guy. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I it's like... the Ramones where you can totally be a dick. <laughs> but I don't think it. That song was recorded. I think that song was recorded for in the Big Lizard se- sessions. I might be wrong, but that was what... recorded. In, I know it was recorded in a rehearsal space on, I believe, on Forty Fourth Street. Well, um, is that what's on the? Uh, is that also on the um, Instant Club hit? No uh, single. No, no. There's a no. different come later. There's another instrumental. It's called Vince Lombardi Service Center. Because we used to always stop there when we were playing shows. And one time we were there with our buddy Rich Hoke. And there was this guy yelling at his kid. He was like, because the kid was looking at his vending machine. He didn't know what he wanted. He's like, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want? And Rich just walks up to him and goes, I want to rock. I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a stop on the New Jersey Turnpike. It's, it's like the northernmost rest area on the New Jersey Turnpike. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure we've stopped, I've stopped there with you guys. You should check out the Yelp reviews. <laughs> Well, thanks for your memories. Well, I have, I do have a question, which okay. I don't think you guys would answer because it just occurred to me. But right. I have a vague recollection, Joe, of you telling me you guys actually recorded, like, uh, some demos for this album, right? And oh, like, yes. Some demos. We recorded a demo of the almost the entire album. And that's lost? You don't have a... No, it's, it's, it's not lost. Oh. You can hear it. It's on the internet. Um, and that I'll, I'll start from there. Yes, we we actually had almost an album's worth of songs that were written before Big Lizard that we had under our belt, so to speak, that we played, we played out in our early days, earliest days, um, such as uh, dance with me, surf and cow, ask me to dance, don't report that baby, girl hunt, that's all right with me, depression day dinner, the puking song, watching Scotty die, and guns for tots. But Those we good de- songs, they should have been on that album. <laughs> we decide, we made a conscious decision to, to re- not record those songs for this album, to record more fresh, newer songs, most of which were written after we recorded the Big Lizard album. So that's, and that may give the album a more unified feel. Um, I don't know. We demoed the songs on Dean's four track, Fostex four track. There's a copy of them you can hear um, on the boot. It was one of the bootlegs of the months on my website a long time ago. Um, we asked John Wicks to produce it. Because we thought he produced our Big Lizard album, and he told us, I didn't produce your Big Lizard album, I only engineered it, but I will produce this album if you want me to. Um, We gave him uh, the mix downs of the demos. He came to our rehearsal space at 1020 RPM uh, once (laughs) after hearing it. (laughs) basically sat sat down with us and said he had a couple changes he wanted us to try. They were minute, but we we tried them. One of them was he added an intro to Air Crash Museum, and he removed the intro from the thing that only eats hippies, because we had started the things on hit thing that only eats hippies was dun, 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 and then Wendell. Then he said, you don't need that beginning part. He also, in Thing the Only Tippies, he had us change. We we were singing now. Now the punks are gonna scream, "Oh yippee!" And he said, "You don't. You, it'll sound better if you just say yippee and take out the word oh." That was about that. Maybe there are a few other things it, that he changed, but those were the main things and the only things we agreed upon and did. He might have suggested other things that we didn't do, but I don't remember. So he didn't, the studio wasn't in its old location. It was in a new new, new place, which actually was closer to where we were living at the time, about six blocks away, farther west in West Philly. But, but he upgraded the studio from 8-track to 16-track. 
and it was in a more lively room because it was instead of a wooden floor or wooden structure house, it was in a concrete former auto garage. Yeah, and I believe like you like drove up a ramp, like the main cutting room was on the second floor. Which yeah, is they used it to had a ramp cars. that you could drive up to for easy load and load out. Yep. So, and a soda machine with beer in it. And uh, yeah, that's I do remember that <laughs> soda machine with beer in it. <laughs> it's still out there. I went to years later. I went to another studio, and that soda machine was there. I was like, oh, I know that one. So you could buy you could buy beer. I don't know how legal it is, but we we set up. This was his idea. He explained it to us where we'd record all together, but our the amps would be in closets, bass amp and closet, and Rodney would be isolated. In fact, that's also how we did big. That's how Big Lizard was recorded with amps and closets. But in, instead of keeping all of the tracks, the, the the intention was to keep only the drums, and then we'd replace everything else separately later. And I believe we had a manager by this time. We didn't have a manager for Big Lizard, but Dave Reckner, who came out, came on our first tour with us as a sound guy and a guy helped to help drive, uh, became our manager. I guess after that tour, we formed a, a legal partnership with him, drew up papers and everything. Um, <laughs> Divorce papers, no. Yeah. We got papers. <laughs> the, the, the Dead Milkmen um, Limited Partnership, I think it was called. Um, he's, I, he suggested that we record the, the, the band when, it, when we did our overdubs, that we would do them individually. And, and like only him and John and like I would be there for the recording of the guitar and then only Dave would and then would be there for the bass as a way to make it more efficient and keep I guess uh <laughs> our goofiness from making the time <laughs> not make it any more efficient at the same time <laughs> same one time the, yeah one of the things I was going to mention was I seem to remember Dave did not enjoy the session no he didn't enjoy the session this is <laughs> I remember not having too much of a, a hard time getting my guitar parts down. And it was actually good having 16 tracks because not only could we have more tracks for drums, but we had extra tracks for safeties. So that if I could get a guitar part and John would say, I think he could do it better, but we'll save that one and you do it better. Then we can erase the other one and may, maybe do that one better a third time. And same with vocals. So... Whereas on Big Lizard, if you're going to do an overdub, you are erasing something to do it again. So you better do it better because too bad. That's the one. That's the take. You didn't have that, that leeway. When it came for Dave to do his bass parts, I remember Dave Reckner came back to our house and said, Joe, there's a problem. Dave needs you. <laughs> you must come. And he was having a fight with uh, John, unfortunately. And Dave, give me ten bucks on Dave. <laughs> <laughs> and I, um, unfortunately, Dave can't fend for himself in this talk. But I, I remember this was all about playing with uh, fingers as opposed to playing with his pick. <laughs> and Dave refused to play with his fingers or didn't want to just for the song "Air Crash Museum." And so I had a talk with him. I said, "Well, can you just try?" <laughs> no, I don't want to. How about if you use uh, your felt pick. I knew he had a felt pick and that that was the solution that he said okay but Dave and John did not get along and we knew that this was the last album that John was going to produce. Oh yeah, it's weird that they went and got you because you're not really a forceful personality. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dave, I mean, you're, 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 you're the master of, press, of passive aggressive judo. I give you that. Maybe that's what it was. <laughs> So I stayed there for the rest of the session of Dave. Uh, and and never again would we record that way. Well, all of our future sessions, we'd always be there for each we'd other. Always be hanging around, for, yeah. For all the things. Except, and we'll get to this later, except sometimes people would go to lunch and let me do a, a solo or something when I went with <laughs> Brian. That was later. But 
and that that's pretty much my memory of 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 recording i do i do i sent an email to our, our manager just recently to see what what it cost to see if he had any stuff like that and other other things that he rem might, may have remembered he said it was a little under five thousand dollars to record it and fever only paid like 1800 or 2000 they didn't pay that whole whole amount they paid the fever record company paid uh basically what it costs to make the big lizard album but this album was costing more because of the protracted protracted way we were recording so it would take i don't know three times longer because we weren't recording it basically as live but it got a live sound because our amps when 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 I did my overdubs and when Dave did his overdubs, the amps didn't stay in the in the closet anymore. They came out into that the live room, the cutting room where the drums were. So they got that natural room sound that the drums got. And a lot of people told us afterwards, it sounds like a live a recording. It sounds very lively. And it also helped that it was a concrete uh, thing. And I just kept pretty much the same amp sound for every song. I did want... My idea for um, another thing that John did that was his idea, I wanted to do backing, back mask vocals in I Hear Your Name in the little parts where it became backwards piano. John didn't like the back backwards vocal idea at all. He said it didn't sound right, and it didn't, I guess, now that I heard the demos again. And he suggested doing backwards, since I want to do backwards, backwards piano. And they had the piano there, an upright. And we just, he said, you know, work work out a part or play some notes. You're going to hear this backwards. Just pretend, you know, you're going to hear it backwards and play notes that think you think would sound right. And that's what I did. And it sounded pretty cool. So that was a good idea of this. And the, the song that we did do live and kept live, because we had to and we couldn't figure out how else to do it, was the Fez. So <laughs> for, that so for that song and that song only, all the instruments were in the cutting room. I had to be, I had to have, I had to be in front of my amp to make it feedback. And that's that. We recorded in January 86. We ran out of money. <laughs> We couldn't mix it right away because we didn't have any money. And Fever wasn't going to pay any more. So we we had a tour booked anyway in February. We made some more money in February and uh, resumed mixing in March and also in April. I guess we got some more money and did it piecemeal. And then when it came out, it wasn't on Enigma. It was on Restless, right? It was on that was it's really the same company enigma and restless are the same company but as far as we we were signed to fever we signed a four we signed an album deal for big lizard with an option to do th they had the option to do three more albums and i think there was even a time the the reason that they come out year after year is because it was like within a year but we we would have to deliver it if unless fever said they didn't want us to like that's that's dropping but we couldn't say we we didn't have the option to say we didn't want to but they had the option to say they didn't want us to do an album drop us but it worked out we did four we did four albums with fever fever in turn uh did what they call a p and d deal a pressing and distribution deal with enigma which <clears throat> is out of our control it wasn't wasn't uh, anything we did but enigma formed a separate um subsidiary called restless so th they kept the um indie distribution like with green world and whatever else they were doing and because they're enigma they they did an, a deal with capital for enigma so that's why it was restless and of course indie distribution means you can only get it in india so if you're <laughs> <laughs> independent of the, major, of the four major, whatever independent of the major labels who's next me so. poor bastard is next might as well be you me <laughs> well joe covered a lot of it i mean yeah i left some just, things he covered like, it in bc the name i didn't cover the name of it but i do have some memories of that go ahead hmm? go ahead because your memories yep. will be better than mine <laughs> 
we we had a joke name for it. I forget who came up with it, but we were we were we play got booked to play a show opening for the Dickies in Irving Plaza. Um and the promoter, I won't mention his name, but you probably know who he is. Uh and this was before we had decided to get John Wicks to do to do the album. He heard from Dave Reckner, I guess, that we were work, working on doing a second album. He said, why don't you record it at Irving Plaza? They're, they're dark uh, for weekdays. A lot of times we can get you in like three days in a row and just record live at Irving Plaza, which I don't think we seriously considered, but Dave Reckner told us this idea while we were there, I think, and uh, we, someone came up with a joke of calling it. Yeah, we can call. We can get a uh, people off the street and in the uh, <laughs> and watch us record an album, mm. and we'll call it the, at Budokan. <laughs> and uh, I really wanted to call that album live at Budokan so badly. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess some I don't remember this at all, but the except somebody wrote it in the comments of one of our big, uh, big questions. The, the New York rocker printed that our second album was to be called at Budokan, so maybe one of us told him that in the interview. <clears throat> but no, it, that was just uh, a title. But the title, uh, on that one tour we did, we ran in a minivan, because <laughs> we didn't own a van yet, and toured the Midwest in February, and it was just miserable. <laughs> <laughs> snow everywhere we almost lost lost control of the minivan several times it would, had no traction <laughs> um but we were we had dinner at some restaurant i don't know sit down restaurant maybe it was shoney's denny's i don't know but <laughs> dave or dave got chicken with and it had parsley on it and he was picking the parsley off because he's a picky eater but i was i said oh you, you don't you don't eat the parsley i he said, no, it's just a garnish. You don't eat parsley. <laughs> and, uh, I think I, I, I'll eat the parsley. And somebody said, e eat your parsley. And it became eat your paisley. <laughs> That's how the album got titled. After it was recorded, before it was mixed. <clears throat> you do have a far better memory than I do. <laughs> Um, yes, and you touched on a lot of things that I wrote down. Um, it, yes, Dan, it does sound crisper and more produced, whatever, whatever that means. And I had forgotten that we had like re just saved the drums and overdid, dubbed everything. Um, but that's, I guess, the first time that we did that. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, we, we did shoot our first video for this album, for the song, The Thing That Only Eats Hippies. And we actually shot it in the main cutting room area of the studio. Um, and it was shot on um, videotape, not film, um, as things were done back then. Um, do you remember the timing of that? Was after was it after the album had been mixed and was ready to be released that we did the video? Do you yes. Remember? Okay. So uh, it, the album got released July 25th and we did the video when we did the video the art was already made up the re it was already pressed so i think the album was actually out if i'm not mistaken all right and because because we we made a book with the album cover on it um it was actually an atlas that i had <laughs> but it was the nursery rhymes book Um, yeah. So, um, what else do I remember? Um, three of the tracks are still played often in our live set. Uh, Beach Party, Two Feet, and Hippies are often in our live set. Um, and I think maybe we touched on this the other day, Joe. We did record a version of Surf and Cow during these sessions, but we deemed it not suitable for release. Yes, I know we recorded a version of Surf and Cow for the demo, too. But we had another uh, instrumental, and two instrumentals is too much for a record. And and yeah, the the surfing cow didn't didn't uh, 
it, it no. wasn't really a stru- it became more structured later yeah but we had the, the instrumental what was it kk Suktu, which was uh was cordy's phone number i think from ruin yeah um that's about all i re- i mean you you covered a lot of it um and yeah, i did one in the vince lombardi service center um I have a couple of links for the Vince Lombardi Service Center. It's famous. <laughs> so that's all I, I, I wanted to add. Am I up? Yep. I'm a grouchy bastard. Uh, first, I want to apologize to Mr. Brian Ferry uh, for not mentioning him next last week. And our older musicians, and I don't want to call you older, Brian, uh, musicians who've been around for a while and don't suck, please don't come to my house and punch me. Please don't do that, Mr. Ferry. Um, also, Dan? When my turn rolls around the next time, I'm going to do pretty music for pretty people so that you can talk about an album that you were on, okay? Hey! And we'll also make it up to you um, when uh, we make our own version of the of the Arrival. Uh, you can play Dan, son of Danther, the chief. <laughs> Have we shown you the Arrival yet? No, I, I, you mentioned it. We need to show you The Arrival. You can watch the whole thing on YouTube. Um, but uh, that'll come up later in another album. The Arrival, a big influence on us. Um, so uh, epilogue. So we released Big Lizard in my backyard, and nobody expected it to do deadly squat, uh, probably including us. And there was actually, I remember a, a thing in the paper where somebody was accusing our a record company of lying by saying they say they've sold 1500 copies that's impossible for a punk rock album and i think at that point it sold like 15,000 so um there's a great saying which is um failure is a bastard but success has a thousand fathers uh but i i don't know those guys in the patriot front all have 20 or 30 fathers each and i don't think they're successful but the uh the thing here is that after big lizard came out there was we were just inundated with people who had advice and if, if people you're lucky enough to have something successful just smile and nod to this day uh when somebody gives me advice in like the comment section i'll come back with something absolutely ridiculous like well if this is your opinion why are you killing whales and they'll be like why would you say that and i'm like oh you don't like people you don't know giving you advice same thing so we got all sorts of horrible advice uh people were telling me like well maybe you should make it appeal to a wider audience and i'm like I'll let you run. I will let you run away from me. Um, it reminds me very much of there's a SCTV sketch in which this uh, group of prisoners had reduced and uh, re- uh, gotten smuggled out an album called Songs of Anger and Defiance, and it wound up being a big hit. So the um, warden put he became like a record producer and he put in a studio and he made them make an album called For Lifers Only that was love songs. And that's kind of the way I feel about this album. It's not a bad album. But compared to Big Lizard, it is kind of defanged. Or you could say it had its balls snipped off in utero. I don't know. But it's not. I wish we kept some of the angrier songs and they had appeared on this one. This one has kind of a college rock feel to me. Um, I do like Moron, which I think is good. Um, I love the cover of the album. I think the cover looks fantastic. Um, As far as uh, songs, Where the Tarantula Lives, um, I wrote that song in 10 minutes to show Rich Kaufman from uh, Electric Love Muffin that I could write a song in 10 minutes. So that was kind of fun. Uh, a lot of the stuff is kind of a blur to me. Like I said, I like Moron. The Fez, the reason in the beginning of the Fez we say, hello, Colin, it's the Fez, uh, is because Colin, who was president of Fever Records, hated that song. So <laughs> that's why, but it really, I I wish this album had more more bite to it. I wish I wish we'd stuck with it with the anger that was pervasive. One day again, we will make a lovely angry album. That's my goal. Before I die, this band will make an angry album again. But I really think I I don't really listen to this one that often. It's not bad. Don't get me wrong. For a, for a second album, it could be worse because you have five or, you know, let's say five years to come up with the stuff that's on your first album, and then if it's successful, you've got five weeks to make that that second album. So that's uh, um. I wish we'd had uh, a little more time to kind of rethink this and and for weeks afterwards, people would walk up to me after it came out and go, "Sorry to hear about your album. Somebody cut his balls off." <laughs> but, um, yeah. yeah. I wish, I wish there was some more harsher stuff on I'll, it. Uh, I'll interject and say I, there were two other things that I wrote down. Um, if you look at the Wikipedia page for the album, there are two two quotes from Canadian newspapers, of all things. The first one was from the Globe and Mail. They wrote that, the, ballet, the band play okay, but sing extra <laughs> And the Ottawa Citizen called the album 
an intentionally tasteless and occasionally funny attack on the love generation of the 1960s. <laughs> it, it's not even occasionally entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I, I don't know what happened. Maybe we're inundated by, you know, when that time things were transitioning from very angry hardcore to happy college rock. And uh, um, maybe that has something to do with it. I don't know. But but a lot of the, I, I would really, if, if there's one thing our music needs, it needs an injection of anger you know i don't i i write songs for people who are carving stuff on desks in detention hall and yeah i think this one i i think i i should have kept that part of my attitude so it's basically my fault i think we should have made a we should have made a uh, a video for beach party vietnam um and then i was also saying do you remember what else i was also talking about um i can't quite remember but i will say that telling dave blood how to play his bass it's kind of like telling Picasso how to paint. You know, <laughs> you, you want to put a little happy face over there. Happy clouds. There we go. So, yeah, I was, uh, um, I, and then Joe and I talked about something else, but I can't remember what it was. So that yeah, I was thinking, I was thinking about that, that story about Dave with the, the pick. And I thought, I wonder how I would have responded because I only play with a pick. And if somebody told me to play with my fingers, I might be like, oh. mm -hmm. See, you know, this is why Dave got Joe and not me, because I just walked in and went, let him play however the fuck he wants to, <laughs> turn around and walked out. But I was busy having sex in the isolation closets. <laughs> and don't you play a couple of our songs with fingers, though? I, You know what? I'd like to play um, If You Love Somebody, Set Them on Fire with fingers. Uh, like, and, and the beginning of Surf and Cow, just because it's like, you know, softer. Um, and like the if you love somebody it's kind of gives it a little like kind of bassier almost like a reggae-ish kind of <clears throat> <yeah. clears throat> but as far i don't think i have recorded anything it's just fingers if you ever feel like it just you know but again there's there's no pressure no, i never I, tell i, I, I do good. not tell anybody anybody at all how to play their instrument? I you, I figure you at the, you know by this point you already know and you <laughs> probably play whatever you play better than I do and people tell me to change stuff all the time but that's because Rodney's on the Rodney's on the shit end of the totem pole in the structure but generally speaking uh, I will not if you if however you want to play something I will not step over and go you know how that would sound better. All right, how about uh, recommendations? How about I give you a finger? <laughs> I recommend a video by the Dead Milkman. It's our new one mm -hmm. called Philadelphia Femdom. And you can see it on our very channel. I recommend that you watch it and maybe even like it. It should be a regular, it should be turned into a television show. I think it would be great. A weekly I, bet series. Net, I bet Netflix would buy it. I really bet Netflix. At some point, Netflix is going to come to us and go, ah, it's cheap. It's, yeah. Yeah, I recommend watching that too. Uh, <laughs> I also, I, I'm going to recommend this book because I'm almost finished it, but um, it's called Into the Wild by John Krakauer. Oh, that guy. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you remember this story that a guy went into Alaskan <laughs> wilderness in like the 90s and he never came out. Um, <clears throat> Alexander Supertramp. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's an interesting story. Um, and, you know, it's written by somebody who obviously wasn't there and he's piecing things together from people he's talked to that met the guy um and little journal entries but yeah basically this guy he he graduated from college and told his parents he was going to just adventure around the country and they never saw him again and for two years he went around the country he made it out west and he spent some time in like arizona and new mexico and then he made it to alaska mostly like hitchhiking riding trains um <clears throat> And I haven't gotten to the end yet, but it tells you in the beginning that he dies. I mean, it was a national news story and it happened. Um, but it's, uh, I don't know, it, it kind of makes you wonder, like, what, one opinion is like, oh, here's this, like, affluent kid who just, like, didn't know 
what he was doing. I'm of that opinion. Yeah. Really went, and I look at it as this was a guy who wanted to change the way he lived his life, knowing that he could die doing what he was doing. And not that it was like a death wish per se, but like he just figured that was, that comes with the territory that, you know, he could die. Like maybe he understood his own ignorance and just, he felt so passionately about like changing his lifestyle that, you know, he went and did it. Um, I, I, I tend to side with the, uh, um, with the Alaskan, um, Oh, a park ranger who said he thought he shot a moose. It was a caribou. He couldn't tell the difference between a moose and a caribou. Fucking moron. <laughs> I'm I'm not a big fan of that guy at, at all whatsoever. Um, and and he's inspired a lot of people to go out and risk their lives doing dumb things. They had to, they had to airlift the bus out of there because the bus became a mecca for again affluent you know people suffering from affluenza who thought <laughs> they should go out in the woods. People be like me, all right. And don't go out and stare at a tree or a cloud. Stay home and make some freaking videos so that other people can go stare at a tree or a cloud. <laughs> but I recommend the book. So yeah, yeah I, I would recommend the book too. It's actually a really good read. Yeah, I'm, I've read it. Yeah, yeah actually, um, I had read his two of his other books. One is called "In to, Into Thin Air" or "In Thin Air" about climbing Mount Everest, and the other one, which is probably the second scariest book I've ever read, was called "Under the Banner of Heaven." Yes. Which I think was turned into a show. I haven't seen um, <clears throat> about the Mormon church. But yeah, that's so that's my recommendation. I thought that was Under an Indifferent Sky, isn't it? Under the Banner of Heaven. Banner of Heaven. Yeah. yeah. Well, the uh, in the Thin Air is a really good read. Yeah. It's disturbing. All right. I would like to recommend a music track uh, video by an artist. Uh, group known as Mick Artistic's Ego Trip. And the track is called Plastic Fox. Mm -hmm. um, you can watch it on YouTube. Um, and I'll provide a link to Mick Artistic's Ego Trip's website. Um, I, I, You just got to see it. I can't really describe it. I mean, he, he might be like Mark e. Smith's father. I don't really know. But uh, it's, it's, it's pretty good. It's my favorite song right now. That's it. Cool. Okay. I have a bunch of stuff here. So we might be here for hours. Uh, I want to start with a new single uh, from the band Years of Denial. Uh, the single is Dancing with Demons, back with BB Kills. Um, they're a really good dark wave band. People stop calling everything post punk. All right. The band Actors is post punk. After that, no, that's just what that label they slap on stuff now. So don't don't call them that. They're more dark wave, um, but you'll really like it. If you do like the uh, the single, check out their whole album, which is called Suicide Disco Volume 2. Um, next, I want to bring up a video you can watch here on the YouTubes, uh, which is called AI Music Sucks uh, from the Your Favorite Band Sucks podcast. Uh, is, I really love these guys. They don't really say AI Music Sucks. They just say that it's going to change things. So if you're making pop music, or if you're making indie pop, you're fucked. Uh, you're fucked because AI can pretty much do what you're doing uh, and maybe do it better. Uh, and as soon as they figure out a way for it to do the vocals correctly, you're done for. Uh, with, but so the only people who will survive are people who can write weirdo lyrics. Mm -hmm. So that'll be good. Um, up next, it's a really interesting video. It talks about what will happen in the next several years and how fascinating it's going to be. Uh, then, now, this is a thing I didn't know until my birthday. It's something I always watch on my birthday. We couldn't find our DVD, uh, so we went on to Amazon, and lo and behold, uh, there is, in 2022, the 50th anniversary of Children Shouldn't Play With Dead Things was released. Uh, yeah, it was a great, great movie. People, this is a film that's been ingrained in my DNA since I was a preteen. Uh, it was shot in 1972. Uh, stars Alan Ormsby, uh, who wrote My Bodyguard and did a lot of great stuff. Um, he actually did the makeup on Cat People. Directed by Bob Clark, uh, who invented the slasher film with the movie Black Christmas. He also invented the teen sex comedy with Porky's. Uh, he's the guy who directed A Christmas Story. Uh, in fact, Jeffrey, who's in this movie, plays Santa Claus in A Christmas Story. So the guy in, who says, you know, you'll shoot your eye out, kid, also gets to say, I peed my pants in this film. So I really, I can't, 
you know, there's no overselling this film. It's one of mankind's greatest achievements. Um, I also recommend we, as we mentioned earlier, you watch the arrival. Well, <laughs> it's, it's out there on YouTube, and we'll give you a link to that, and and just get, get all excited when the part that you're all bathed in light. How can this be? Uh, and then finally, this is what we need to do. I was thinking about clickbait earlier. So if if I decide to go with the uh, um, the uh, um, you know the pretty music for pretty people idea of doing that one, we should have a thing that says. What is Rodney Anonymous's favorite Dead Milkman album with a big question mark? And then people would click in, click B. The same way if you have a like a little rock and roll thing, you say, like, you know, how a chance encounter with a beach boy became a career win for Charles Manson. Well, you've given it all away. So change that to how a chance encounter with a beach boy became a career win for this mystery rocker. <laughs> there you go. I'm full of I'm full of the Viser. Oh, something to speak. Dan really liked that one. He's Dan, son of Danfer, the chief. <laughs> I love all the Charles Manson references. Uh, oh, I know. And he's on the show. Him and bears are on the show so often. Or animal attacks. All right, I'm getting way off topic, but I, I poured myself too much wine tonight. So. I'm city. <laughs> all right. Thanks, um, everyone. Yeah. Go home and tune in next week. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> or don't <laughs>